I'm busy in a, a series where I'm, where I'm talking about uh, predestination and what predestination actually is. Wherein the Bible says that God has predestined us unto the adoption of children. Where God has come before the foundation of the world and has decided and predestined us unto something. Now, uh, I've said this last Sunday, for those of you that weren't here, that God didn't decide before time who is the person that will accept Him and who is the person that will not accept Him. He has predestined man unto a certain way of life. That's actually what it is all about. And we, as free will agents, can have the freedom to partake of that kind of a life should we want it or not. Um, but God has predestined before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless above reproach in His sight by His doing. So God by His doing made us holy and blameless above reproach in His sight by Jesus Christ. And that was what He decided before the foundation of the world. Now, the reason why I'm going to minister the message today, where I'm going to focus on adoption and what adoption is, is so that we can understand the process of the gospel, so that we can easily make use of it in everyday life. Uh, you know, the gospel cannot just be a theory. It must be something that we can use every day. Uh, every day we deal with the normal things of this world, wherein we want to experience His quality of life. And should we understand the kingdom of God and how God function and how the relationship between the Father and the Son function in heaven, we can make use of that truth and experience that kind of a life today. If I look at my life um, as, you know, since I got a hold of the message of grace, I found in the beginning stages, I would say the first five years or ten years of it, was um, all about the wonderful, uh, or this joy of knowing a different kind of a gospel, that God is not angry with me. But as I found it continue and I matured in this message, I found the dynamics of the relationship that there is between the Father and the Son um, basically taking over my life and I started to enter into a relationship with God on the foundation that Jesus has with the Father. And now I find a joy that is unspeakable. I can't say that I don't have trouble. I can't say that, you know, there aren't things that doesn't go, I've just testified, you know, the one of my cars caught fire and the other one they tried to hijack. You know, but in that time I find this wonderful joy of not questioning my faith, you know, questioning uh, the integrity of God or anything like that. You know, for me to question the integrity of God when my car breaks would be, to to would be equal to questioning the integrity of my wife should the microwave oven break. You know, you cannot connect these, these, these things to each other. You know, why do we want to connect the faithfulness of God to the ability of a German to make a car or for wiring to stay okay for 20 years in a car? You know, we cannot do it that way. And, and what's the wonderful thing about understanding this concept of adoption is, um, you know, we've, we've had such a wrong concept of adoption that we actually miss the whole dynamics of the gospel when it comes to adoption. Now, in today's message, I'm going to uh, explain, touch on four points. Number one, the original plan that God had w has with us, which all of us know, but I want to touch on that. And then I'm going to explain that adoption is actually to be made immortal. That's what it actually is. We've had a wrong concept of adoption. No condemnation for those who are late. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> you are welcome, my friend. So, <laughs> um, so, so, uh, Adoption, I'm going to explain adoption as a futuristic event and as something that has actually not taken place yet. Now that can sound like bad news, but I'm going to tell you, should you understand this, you'll understand the good news of the gospel because adoption has actually got nothing to do with um, you being uh, God making you his child or not. Okay, and uh, we've, we're really going to have to move some traditional thinking in that point. And then I'm going to connect that to Romans 7 and fruit of the flesh. 
and um, explain it in the light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and uh, the resurrection of the dead that we're going to have. Now, the reason I do this, like I said, is so that we can understand the process wherein we see fruit in our life. Because we want to see fruit in our life. We want a happy marriage. We want peace when it comes to our health. We want peace when it comes to our finances. We want peace when it comes to how we operate our business. We want peace when it comes to our relationship with God. And we want that peace to be a fruit of God and not a something that we work up in our own life. Um, we want the quality of God's life in us with the ease that we have um, that, that Bertus or uh, Hendry, the ease that it is for him to have red hair. You know, it's easy. It comes very naturally. He, it would be difficult for him to change it. He'll have to spend money to change it. Okay, and then after a while he's going to find naturally the red hair come out again. Uh, for Bertus to be like me uh, in how he walks and how he deals with certain things is natural. It is born in him. It is not something I tried, I taught him. It's natural. And that is what we want to experience in everyday life. And we are experiencing, but we want to continue to experience that kind of a life. As easy as what it is for God to be holy and righteous and think good, that is what God has got in mind for every human being. And He took care of everything needed to have it that way for us. So, the first point that we must realize is that God's plan with man um, was to have a wonderful love relationship with mankind. Now, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a word that people has, you know, like, let's, let's use the word gay. The word gay means to be happy. That's what it means. But we can't use the word gay today. I can't say, man, I really feel gay today. <laughs> People will not say, our preacher, he will say, he came out of the closet. That's what they'll say. You know, he revealed the secrets of his heart. He's gay. No, I'm just happy. That's what gay actually means. But the meaning of the word has changed over time. In the same way, you know, we, we find the meaning of, of the word uh, adoption has changed. You know, to a place where we think that adoption is just something that will happen or that we do when somebody with a child that doesn't have parents and we adopt him into our life. You know, in the very same way when it comes to the word Trinitarian. The word Trinitarian is now a big English word, but what it actually means is, if you go and study in Webster's, it means, uh, uh, um, the definition of it is somebody that believes in the Trinity, that there is a Trinity. Now, I find it very difficult to think that you can have a quality Christian life without being a Trinitarian. But these days, if you say you're a Trinitarian, the word has changed, and I say this for the, for the, uh, uh, the, the web church that's watching via the internet, because I don't think we've dealt with it in our church here, but this is more for the internet. Um, We've, if you, today, if you say you're a Trinitarian, it, it, they say you're a universalist or an inclusionist or a, you, know, you believe everybody will be saved, even the devil will be saved and all those kind of things because it's coined under that name. So I wanted to make that clear. I believe in the Trinity and without this wonderful Trinitarian life which there is in the Godhead, the Bible uses the word Godhead as the Trinity, we don't have any hope. We are back to, uh, uh, or we are in, we, we will be doomed to a system where we've got this God in heaven that only knows what it is to be alone. He will have no ability to uh, know what it is to love someone. He wouldn't have the ability to have compassion because who would he have had compassion with? Unless he comes from a family orientated Unless he is a family orientated being. So when it comes to the Trinity, um, I believe, and this was God's original plan, was for man to share in the family life that God possess. In heaven, the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they've never been alone, ever. They don't know what it is to be alone. Should somebody be lonely or alone, compassion comes forth in the heart of God for, for that person to share in the warmth of family life 
That is what God wants. That is His plan. And that is the foundation on which the whole gospel is built. That was the foundation from where God planned you. And anything that would contradict sound family values cannot be part of the gospel. Um, let me use some practical examples. I cannot test my son by putting him through a hard time, you know, if he is faithful to me. You know, because should I do that, you know, I'm going to harm family relationship. Should I test my wife as if she's faithful to me by, you know, uh, finding a very attractive person and paying him money to try and flirt with her to see if she's going to be faithful to me, you know, and she finds that out, it can be the end of the relationship. Because she would say, my husband is crazy. And we will have a massive fight and she will say, you know, I cannot live like this. But yet we've ascribed attributes like that to God, you know, wherein He will test us to get us to, to make us faithful. He put us through hard times to purify us. And this, we've, we've tried to mix family values with this God that is only interested in His kingdom and advancing His kingdom that's a boss somewhere. You know, like we would have normal kings and politicians of the day. We try to mix this and present the gospel. But what I believe in in this church is, um, and in dynamic love ministries all, all over the world, what, what I try to uh, preach and share is this Trinitarian life. The wonderful quality of life in the Trinity where there is something like freedom of choice. Where there is something like um, love. And from this love we find a relationship come forth. Because once you're in an atmosphere of love, you find faith naturally comes. And once you're in an atmosphere of love, you find trust is the next thing that just happens to you. You know, which is the English word for believe. It's the word trust. They are synonyms. So belief is natural. A hope, a confident expectation of good is not something we try to do every day to try and work hard at to keep our hope. It is something that flows from a good relationship. And that's why it's so important for me and important for us to understand that that is the foundation from where God functioned. God came and He, from that foundation, said, in the beginning, let us make a planet let us put humans on this planet that they can know how it feels to be like us and let us fellowship with them. Let us give them the ability to multiply that they will never have to be alone, that they can feel what it is to be like us. That they can know how it is to have their own kind in human flesh like what we have our own kind in spirit and fellowship together and let us live with them, let us live in them and let us share the basic building blocks of who and what God is with them so they can experience our life. That is why God made man. That is how He placed man on the earth for that purpose. Like I've said many times before, those of you that are here maybe for the first time today, um, God was not in need of a garden. And then He made a wonderful garden and then He realized, oh my goodness, but somebody needs to tend this garden to keep it beautiful. And then he made gardeners to work in his garden for him, actually creating slaves. That was not God's plan. That is not God's plan with you. And I want you to know every day when you wake up in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, doesn't matter what happened the previous day, wake up with this in mind. When you go to bed at night, and this is a very practical thing to do, you know, when you go to bed at night, just think of your union with the Trinity. Think that, think that you are the same kind as what God is. He even became a human and there's a human in the Godhead. Ponder upon that. Be practical about it, you know. L let it dwell in your heart. And many times we find the Holy Spirit brings something to our heart. You start to think of something good, you know, about your union with God. Just allow that thought to continue maybe for five minutes. You know, because the Holy Spirit is busy with something in your heart. You know, years ago, um, you know, I was thinking that what you have to do is you have to um, spend an hour quality time with God. And then God will speak to you. And He will do that. And it, like with any relationship, it is good to spend an hour, you know, a day just talking to my wife. Spending quality time with her. 
speaking to her and she speaks to me. But the moment she comes and says, Bertie, you know, every day we need to spend an hour quality time. We're going to fight. Because there's going to come a day when I don't spend the hour and then I'm going to start to feel guilty. And once I feel guilty, then I'll approach the next time we spend an hour together with guilt. And maybe I will now buy flowers to say I'm sorry, but the buying of the flowers was not because I love her, but because I feel guilty. And now guilt is becoming the father of my life. You know, and not God. And not life, and not my love for her and her love for me. So, um, in the very same way, when it comes to our everyday life, know this, that you are in union with God. And that God will always relate to you from the foundation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From a Father. That's, he came and He revealed Himself, number one to us, as Father. And when He made man, He made man to have the ability to eternally live with Him that way. Now what I've just said, that word eternally is where the whole problem comes in and where the whole fall of man comes in and where the whole restor restoration of Christ comes in because Jesus Christ had to come and restore what Adam, what got lost in Adam to the point that we can now again eternally have in a human body the quality of life that God intended for us. And the only way in which God can restore something, the only way in which God can make something new, is by the concept of birth. By the concept of Him taking His only life and putting it in you. You know, the word Yahweh means the self-existing one. Uh, that means He exists on His own, by Himself, and, will ha and He has that ability um, forevermore. No other being possesses that ability. Only God. In the beginning, God was there. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in this unity, they, 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 they possess the ability to exist by themselves. They are righteous in their being. And they will be like that forevermore. They, they exist out of righteousness. And the only way that you can have that is if the only self-existing one comes and exists in you. That's the only way you can partake of righteousness. That is the only way you can partake of restoration. If you got lost in your mind, let's talk practical every day, if you got lost in hurt and pain, the only way it can be restored is for the one who doesn't have hurt and pain to come and live in you with his emotions and his feelings. So it will be by His doing, Him giving birth to that in you. And then the dynamics of the Godhead and how we have been created works this way. The way that birth takes place is through something called persuasion of the heart. It's persuasion of the heart. Guys, you have, you'll have to get the CD and go through this again because I'm really touching on some, some very, very uh, 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 basic but or f fundamental stuff that's needed to understand in our relationship with God. The only way that um, the only way that Julius Malema can give birth to fear in your heart is if you believe what he says. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? So faith, and, and like I said, this year I'm going to talk a lot about faith and what faith really is. Because we've got such a wrong concept about faith that we don't want to actually have anything to do with faith because we, we feel that we're not going to have enough faith. And then we're going to be disqualified again. So let's just get it completely out of our gospel. No, we are including faith. It's one of the most beautiful things there is. Should you want to take faith out of my relationship with God, I want to die and I don't want to exist anymore. Make me non-existing then. Uh, I don't want a relationship with a person that I cannot believe in. How do you have a relationship with Him? If I cannot live by faith, then what I behold will never have its ability to be born in me. I want it birthed in me. So what God had to come and do in His whole restoration plan, He had to bring forth a truth that we can believe in so that that truth can be born in us and so He restores mankind in that way. That is, and the reason why we have that connection called belief or faith is because of our design. It's not, not because God, um, like many people believe, planted a tree in the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden to test the faithfulness of Adam and Eve. That's not 
why the tree was there. I don't have time to explain that now. But he did not put faith there to have another reason to disqualify somebody to be saved. Faith is part of your design. It's part of your makeup. It's the way God functions. So here he comes and he says that God has predestined, um, he has predestined man unto the adoption of children. Now what is this adoption? Let me define the adoption. And we're going to read Romans 8 verse 23. Uh, those of you that have a Bible uh, on the internet, you can read it. Those who want to read with me, because this is very important to understand. We're going to really shift the paradigm today. We're going to shift the paradigm. <clears throat> While you go there, let me say this. The way his life enters my life is by him first qualifying me to partake of his life. When we were married to the law, according to Romans 7, it would have actually been illegal for God to marry us because we were married to another. So first the law had to die so that we could become what you call a widow or not married or not having a contract with the law. Then, being free from the law, and when we became free from the law, we could not be seen as a sinner anymore. Okay, because what will qualify you as a sinner? There's no law. That's why he first had to make the whole world innocent and bring the whole world into righteousness so that he could now come to these people that are as holy as what he is and bring to them this truth of how holy they are and how righteous they are so that they could believe in this holiness and righteousness so that they, this holiness and righteousness could be born into them and when I talk about that birth is the manifestation in everyday life experiencing his life that is the whole system of restoration so what he has come to do here and he came and he wants from the beginning his plan was to adopt us as his sons now or, or actually to take his sons and adopt his very own sons which sounds contradictory another word for adoption we can actually take the word adoption scratch it out of the bible and write in the word revelation or reveal to manifest that would be a much better translation for that word let us see what the adoption really is and not only they but ourselves also we have the first fruit of the spirit even we ourselves grow sorry this is uh, Romans 8 23 yeah. um, and not only they but ourselves also we have the first fruit of the spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption so what does Paul come here he, call, he comes and he says listen we have the first fruit of the Holy Spirit already in us the first fruit of the spirit was the receiving of the Holy Spirit it was the fruit of love and joy and those things which naturally happened by them seeing oh I'm not under the law oh I see how much God loves me I became part of this Trinity Godhead life and he is good to me he's bestowed his goodness upon me I feel accepted I feel loved free from my works and in that atmosphere of being pampered by his goodness and his love you find your heart became persuaded of how righteous you are how good you are how holy you are and you start to see the spirit of God bringing forth the fruit of holiness the fruit of peace the fruit of I am accepted the fruit of I cannot be condemned in your in your life and that we call the first fruit of the spirit the first fruit. So here Paul comes, that's already at the place where he's bearing the first fruit of the Spirit, and listen to what he says. We wait, we, as me, Paul, the Apostle, let me put it that way, as holy as what, as what you want to think I am, I am still waiting for the adoption. So here's the Apostle Paul waiting to be adopted. What is this adoption? Let's read what the Bible says. To wit, the redemption of my body. Let me read it in a, a, another translation here. Um, I think it's American Standard Version here. It says, however, not only the creation, but we who have the first fruit of the Spirit also groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, so what is the adoption? It is the revelation of our sonship 
in him making our physical body immortal for his plan was to so you know for me I've known this for maybe 15 years okay this is the first time I actually preach on it and still when I use the word adoption I want to think of adopting a child like what we do here Paul declares adoption as the revelation if you read on there um, in, in Romans he actually says that creation waits for the revelation or the manifestation of the sons of God what that means is that there are sons of God there are people whose life is born from God like I've explained this birth now you know which has come to the place where they've heard the good news they, they feel the inner unctions God has lured them with his love to the point where in this relationship it becomes a faith thing they believed as they believed this truth that spirit in which they believed entered their life flooded their mind flooded their life that spirit by the power of resurrection not your willpower gives birth to a brand new life in you and now these people are called the sons of God they are led not by the law they are led by the spirit the Bible says those who are led by the spirit are called the sons of God in Romans 8 14 so what is it talking about those who can say the life I live today the, 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 the emotions that's in me the passion that's in me to do something the generosity that rises in my heart the love for other people you know that comes forth in me that are led by the Spirit remember the Spirit is to believe in the grace gospel the flesh is to believe in legalism those who are led by the Spirit those who are saying I'm standing under the grace of God those that see that life manifest in them they are called the sons of God and God is going to manifest uh, uh, he's going to show his sons to the whole creation and the way in which he's going to show his sons is by taking that power that is bringing forth the fruit in you that very same Spirit is even going to make you immortal and that we know even when that's going to happen it's going to happen when Jesus comes back that's what the Bible teach so why is this so important to understand for us in church you know the Apostle Paul in almost every one of his messages he preached on the resurrection the Christian hope today is not the hope that the there will be money in the bank when you put the card in the Christian hope is we've got a confident expectation that we as the children of God shall be made immortal by his doing for he has predestined us unto the adoption God has predestined man that man would not have the ability to die and have no attribute of death whatsoever in his life and now he's, the gospel is preached we see the first fruit of that adoption which is a, a normal fruit of the spirit love joy peace and those things by his doing and the latter rain or the latter fruit if you want to call it like that will be the manifestation of immortality and when our minds as Christians and I, I, I just took, and I thank God that I've walked with this for many years so now I can talk out of this experience that I've had over time as my mind started to go away from heaven and hell and please I don't want to um, you know some will say I don't say there's, a, there's no heaven I will say there's no hell man the Bible says there's a heaven and a hell so why do you want to argue now about the thing it is written in the Bible okay I believe in that but my focus is not heaven or hell my focus is what the Apostle Paul's focus was if you're going to read the Apostle Paul's focus the focus was man I don't want anything to do with legalism for this legalistic system wherein I am defined by how big my business is what car I drive who I am in the flesh and what I can possess through my own ability in working uh, working systems to have quality, God's quality of life is just gonna kill me I don't want anything to do with that what I want is to hear how much he loves me how much he accepts me how I am unified with God in the Trinity and then from there see the first fruit and my expectation is then to see immortality and the hope that I have is that I will see that immortality in the return of Christ and should I die thank God that I will then at least go to heaven but then Jesus will return I will return with him and receive my immortal body for he predestined mankind to be 
immortal with him forever sharing in his trinity life you see we have made the end goal of Christianity heaven and if you make the end goal of Christianity heaven the manifestation of the spirit wherein he wherein God resists sin in you wherein God brings holiness forth in you free from your works is not going to have the, the focus is not going to be there the focus is just I just want to one day make it to heaven I know I'm going to make it to heaven you know but who wants to be in heaven when Jesus comes to earth it's going to be a lonely place it's going to be a lonely place and and for the people watching via the web you know we have to put these things down otherwise we're going to fall into so much wrong doctrine especially pastors watching thank you for watching um, the stuff I'm really honored to preach to you and uh, share the gospel with leaders watching all over the world it's wonderful for me to know that thank you for for um, for listening to this and sharing this with your church and as as leaders I want you to know that it's so important for us to preach the correct doctrine because should we bring a, a wrong doctrine again we're going to find people's belief is going to be wrong and from that heart flows that which drives our life and then we're going to see our people struggling again with all sorts of trouble and we will struggle ourselves and never have peace so when we look at this um, my mind you know is thank God for heaven you know and thank God that I will go to heaven and heaven will be a wonderful place but when Christ returns and the earth is made new his original plan that he always had will continue for he predestined us unto immortality he predecided that man will be holy and blameless above reproach before him in an immortal human flesh and so shall we have family wonderful relationship with him wherein who he is is birthed into us to the point that you will find like Jesus said if you've seen me you've seen the father and that is what God wants for, for each one of us. And the process is already taking place. We are already seeing the first fruit of the Spirit. So in my life, if I look at my life over the years that I've believed this, my focus is I want to hear the good news for this good news is what persuades my heart. I only want to hear how much He loves me. I only want to hear how innocent I am. I only want to hear how I am fully in union with Him. I only want to hear about my co-seatedness with Him in the Trinity. I only want to hear about what He freely gave me. I only want to hear what quality of life He possessed and what He shared with me freely. And I only want to hear that about every human being and that is all that I want to share with people why because that is the only way by which we will find his life manifest in our lives and that is the only way by which we're going to see immortality manifest by him bringing forth his life in us and by the way that is what that verse in the Bible means where it says he's the author and the finisher of our faith the author of what we believe is the one that brought this forth and that's bringing forth the fruit in our life today and he is the finisher he is the one that shall make us immortal now I want to just say something about immortality here um, uh, everybody will know who I talk about but I, I don't want to name names I don't believe in that from the pulpit uh, we all know about a guy that preached immortality that you can have immortality today and that he passed away now I'm not preaching that kind of an immortality I don't believe that you can be Im immortal today I believe that we shall be made immortal in the return of Jesus Christ and not a day before then and we can claim immortality until we blue in the face we will die like anybody else you know it's not by how you believe that you shall be made immortal you know to be made immortal what what is going to happen is that is what we expect that is what we hope you know and that is what he will bring forth he's the finisher of that and the Bible says what do we do about that and we're going to read that first the Bible says we patiently wait for that adoption and he shall bring it forth the problem that I have with the old system of adoption is that we in our subconscious mind we get programmed with a belief that we are not legitimate children of God because he adopted me 
If you're adopted, whose child are you? Say, um, you know, I was adopted. I mean, who's my father? You will always live with a thing that I'm adopted and this is my father, but I actually have another father. So, I believe that that system, and, it, and, and that, that system got into the church and now we sit, as, especially as Gentiles, you know, we sit with a system of we were, the Jews were the original children of God and we are the adopted children of God. That is bull. The Jews, should they believe, like anybody, in this wonderful love message, can be adopted. They are not adopted. To them pertain the adoption, according to Romans 9, they were adopted as a nation through which God gave the law and all the types and the shadows. They were adopted like that. But the adoption of immortality that we talk about here, or actually the re revealing of the children of God, when God reveals our true glory. You know, who you are cannot be revealed outside of you becoming immortal. It is impossible. No money can reveal who you are. No worldly success can ever reveal who you are. God will reveal who you are in you becoming immortal. And that will be such a powerful explosion that because you've been made from dust of the earth, the moment you explode into that immortality, the, the, that dust, because you've taken from the dust of the earth, this earth shall also explode into the very same thing. That's the power that is inside you. Already there. It is now exploding in things like love and joy and peace and generosity and kindness and those kind of things. But there's an explosion to take place which will be in this immortal life. The reason I say this, and I know I'm repeating myself, is so that we can have our mind away from I just want to do everything right to get to heaven one day. No. I want to be part of God's way of doing things. God's way of doing things is I sit down, He loves me, by that love, I get persuaded about His love. That love gives birth to a new life in me. And that life eventually will have immortal flesh for that was what He predestined for me from eternity. Amen. We cannot live with a thing of, I'm not a legitimate child. The adoption, the Hebrew adoption, the adoption that God talks about here, talks about a person that is already a son, already a child. To be adopted or to be revealed as a son, you first have to be a son. So know this, you are, you are not, you're not the fake, fake Rolex or the fake Nike. You're the real thing. Amen. Let us just read uh, Romans here. I'm going to touch on the two other points and then we're going to end off. Romans 8.13. I'm just going to read this and as I read this you'll understand what I said. If we live according to the flesh or human effort to have eternal life, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit or by the message of God's love and grace, you continually put to death the activities of the body, you will live. So what he says here is life is contained in God living in you, basically, and not you living by the law. For all who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery that leads you to fear again. Instead, you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So he said, the spirit that will reveal us as his sons making us immortal. We've already received that spirit. That bomb is already planted. Now we, okay, um, then goes to verse 15. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, if we are children, we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs of the Messiah. If, in fact, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, what it says here is, and this is the wonderful thing about faith. He says here, listen, this dynamics of God bearing fruit in you is only active in us as long as what we are persuaded of His goodness. That is not saying God will not be good to you if you don't believe that He's good to you. It talks about your design. Like I said in the beginning, I found that God has always been good to me. But I found my life, the life I lived, was born from the law. 
even after I received Jesus as my Savior. But once I started to believe in the goodness of God, and I was persuaded of His goodness, I can now say, the good I do is born from grace. Hallelujah. It says in verse 19, For creation is eagerly waiting for the revelation or the manifestation of God's sons. Because the creation has become subject to futility through um, not by anything they did, but by the one that subjected him, which was Adam. That the creation itself would be set free from the corrupting bondage in order to share in the glorious freedom of God's children. For we, for we know that all the rest of creation has been groaning with pains of birth up until, this, up until this present time. And the verse 23 says, And we groan as well. For we were saved with this hope in mind. What is this hope? Verse 23, That we shall be made immortal. So it says here that God will take His children, He will take His children and reveal His children by making them immortal through the Spirit that's in them bringing forth that fruit. Not their doing, the Spirit in them. He will bring that fruit forth and that is the hope which we have been saved unto so what is the Christian hope the Christian hope is not like I said I hope next time I find a parking close to the church that's not the hope the hope is I've got a confident expectation you know that I I've been saved unto a certain hope this hope is that he shall bear his fruit in me and I'm not going to tamper with that hope by mixing what I believe with legalism for then legalism will give birth to its death and I will have this mixed feeling mixed life mess Wherein we would rather say we're going to sit under the pure word of God's unconditional love and I've got this confident expectation that He shall bring forth His love in my life. He shall bring forth His power in my life, His wisdom in my life by me simply allowing Him to serve me with His love. Glory to God. Amen. So, the moment we start to see the hope and the whole system, how we work, we find this life. Let me end off by just reading these verses. Ephesians 1 verse 4, it says, And according as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved you see in the beginning God chose us in Christ he has never ever thought of you outside of the holiness that Jesus himself possessed he doesn't have that kind of a thought then we got into a system which killed us then God said, this wonderful, wonderful possession, that system is called legalism through Adam and Eve. Then God said, my wonderful possession is now lost in this legalism. So let me kill that system and bring them back to the original plan that they can function the way I've intended beforehand in Christ. As Christ functions between the Father and the Son, we've been chosen in Him in that way of functioning, no other way. And he has predecided that we shall have, be adopted, have this immortality, and from there have a relationship with him. Glory to God. And let me end off this way, how do we apply this in everyday life? The practical way in which I apply it in everyday life is by having a mindset that is focused on as he loves me and as I feel loved his love is born in me by him so should I lose my temper should I do things that I don't think is good should I feel and you know what I've moved past this grace message brought me to a place where should I do something like lose my temper or get upset or like just before the service I got upset we were at the house and I locked the house and we went out and uh, Aubrey took the car from we've got two properties so from the one to the other one and then um, to, to load everything up 
And then I um, locked the house and then the key of the car was still in the house. So I locked, but then I, I locked it with those, those yellow locks just pulled closed. But then I still had the key to get into the house for, for the other door, but I forgot the key in the door on the other side for I locked it from the inside. Now it's like more fees, yo. Okay. Now I said, now the half feast, if, if I'm upset, walking up and down there, I'm upset. No, man, but now let's get him. Let's put the, the smallest child through the window. Go and open the thing. You know, you know, and you talk like somebody that's upset. And you go away there and you think, but that was not the nicest way of doing it. I'm not thinking of I've sinned towards God or anything. I'm just thinking that is not the most enjoyable life. That's all. That this needy lacquer to live in. It's not the nicest life. That's all. And then, practically using this is, the only system in which patience and wisdom in a situation like that can be born in me is not by me deciding anything. It's by me allowing him to love me and give birth to his patience and his wisdom in me in that situation. That's the only way. That's a practical application. And I'm not aiming for heaven. I know that this system is going to continue for eternity. This is the way it's going to work forever. Glory to God by you being persuaded of His love. So the self-existing one can exist in you and you so coexist with Him. Is that not good news? I think you'll know the Makar Gepreek. You see, I the for me that nice, yo. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Let us just pray together. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you so much for these people. As they sit here, I can so clearly feel your love for them. As I look at everyone's face and I just see them, they're so beautiful. So beautiful. Clothed with your glory. I thank you for your love that you have given us. I thank you, Lord, that you have not decided that love can be contained in just the car I drive or where I stay, but you, that you had a much bigger, a much more glorious plan, which was that we can enjoy that Trinity life. And that we can have this absolute beautiful attribute called persuasion of the heart or faith. Father, I want to thank you that from this wisdom and your life that flows in me, I can now feel to pray for some sick people and we can see miracles happen. And this is not something we do to say, well, we've got the power of God. <laughs> for we all have the power of God. Thank you, Father, I can just pray right now for every person here that needs wisdom in their business. I thank you, Lord, that the favor that is upon them is seen by people and they are just drawn to them. I thank you, Lord, that I can pray for every person here that has got worries, that they will have peace of mind outside of just a change of circumstances. Not that the circumstances will not change, but just absolute peace of mind in the contentment that is born in us from you and from their wisdom and revelation. I declare every person here that might have problems with sugar diabetes, with um, struggling with pains and migraines and stress, all kinds of sickness, people that might fear they've got cancer, Whatever it is, I declare you fully healed in the mighty presence of God and the presence of His love wherein He gives birth to healing in your life by the doing of His goodness towards you, manifesting His goodness. And our hope is to see the fruit of the Spirit manifest in us and then eventually immortality. Thank you for sharing your life with us, O oh God. Amen and Amen. That's awesome. I just want, I forgot about the announcement I want to make. People watching from the United States, <clears throat> um, those of you that want to make donations via checks towards Dynamic Love Ministries, some of you have sent checks made out to Dynamic Love Ministries. I'm not um, safe harbor 
the uh, group that I um, am still with has stopped their service uh, towards missionaries and helping them to get the money into certain accounts and whatever. Um, I'm not registered in the United States, so you'll have to make out the check to G Brits. We've had some of you send checks made out to Dynamic Love Ministries. Um, funny as what it may sound, South African banks does not accept checks from America. So sorry guys, we cannot use those checks. Just make it out to G Brits. Go to my website under donate. You will find the, um, the, the address where you need to mail it to. Thank you so much for your faithful support. God bless you. God bless you guys. Thank you. Amen.